Yeah, thanks for the introduction. I also want to start by thanking the organizers for the kind invitation to present here at this conference. Uh, I get nothing to disclose, and I also want to take a brief moment to introduce the institute I'm coming from, uh, as it is still relatively new. So I'm from the KITS, which is short for the Hub Children's Cancer Center in Heidelberg. This is a joint institution of the German Cancer Research Center that I'm also affiliated with, the Heidelberg University Hospital and the University of Heidelberg. And um, the KITS is a combined center for the therapy and research of the oncological and hematological diseases of childhood. Okay, and so now I want to begin this presentation with some important facts and figures about childhood cancer. So cancer is a leading cause of death for children and worldwide around 300,000 children between the ages 0 to 19 are diagnosed with cancer every year. So in total, cancer, pediatric cancer uh, represents 1% of all cancers. So the majority is, of course, adult cancers. In high-income countries, more than 80% of the children with cancer can be cured in this day and age. But in many of the low- and middle-income countries, this number, this number is only at around 20%. The survival rates vary dramatically depending on the tumor type. So the five-year survival rate for the most common pediatric cancer, ALL, um, is a type of leukemia is 90%. In contrast, the five-year survival rate for the pediatric brain tumor, DIPG, is less than 5%. Um, and I also want to note that there's an increase in the incidence of um, neoplasms since the 80s in children. So in 1975, it was 13 children per 100,000, and the number is now up to 17 children per 100,000. Um, this is, again, worldwide. So what are the cancer types that most commonly affect children? So this figure shows the distribution of the different cancer types split by the different age groups. And as you can see in the age group 0 to 14, leukemia is the most common um, cancer followed by the central nervous system cancers and then the lymphomas. The most common sympathetic nervous system tumor is neuroplastoma. And I also want to point out the sarcomas. Sarcomas are a group of solid cancers comprising a variety of different bone and soft tissue tumors, most commonly osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, and then there are many more um, rare subtypes. As I have already mentioned, um, leukemias are the most common type of pediatric tumor. However, brain tumors are the leading cause of cancer-related deaths in children, and it's also the most common solid tumor, comprising roughly 20%. Of course, there are many different subgroups of brain, um, pediatric brain tumors. Um, about half of them, the largest group, are glial tumors, and among those, the most common type is low-grade astrocytoma. And then there are also the high-grade gliomas and different brainstem gliomas, like the DIPGs. And I specifically want to point out medulloblastoma. Medulloblastoma is among the most common malignant childhood brain tumors. It is a heterogeneous group of an embryonal tumor occurring in the cerebellum. And it comprises at the moment four subgroups, which are also acknowledged in the HWO classification. And they occur sort of in different locations within the cerebellum, like in red here, the sonic hedgehog subtype, or in blue, the wind subtype. As both of these names imply, those are the underlying pathways that are affected by mutations. And then there is group three and group four. Um, and as the names imply, until recently, not too much was known about them. So very recently, just a few weeks ago, we have published this study based on roughly 700 group three and group four medulloblastomas and subgrouped them even further into eight subgroups. This was based on DNA methylation array data using a machine learning method that does some classification. However, this is also supported by a variety of clinical features and molecular features, like the overall survival difference between these subgroups, um, female to male ratios, um, the driver driving genes, and cytogenetics. 
So, and this is a general theme across many of the pediatric tumors. There's more and more subgrouping into um, much finer subgroups, which more details. And that, of course, also has implications for clinical trials. But I only have time here to go into the specifics of medulloblastoma also, because medulloblastoma is one of the most sequenced pediatric tumors. For example, um, during the International Cancer Genome Consortium in Germany, specifically at the DKFC, we sequenced already over 200 medullo samples by whole genome sequencing. So a lot of the um, initial findings that define the pediatric cancer landscape were made in these tumors. That's why I want to specifically point this out here so you will see medullopistoma coming up on the next slide. So after this um, introduction, um, um, this is the rest of the talk outline. So um, I'm going to go th now through somatic alterations across the pediatric tumors, followed by germline alterations, so cancer predisposition and familial risk. Then the potential drug targets and therapeutic vulnerabilities and some of the existing clinical sequencing platforms, and then I'll end with a summary. So um, in a large pediatric pan cancer study that we published last year, we analyzed 24 pediatric and 11 adult cancer types. The adult cancer types are based on published TCGA data. Um, and those samples were analyzed for DNA alterations, and all of the data was based on either whole exome or whole genome sequencing. And this figure shows now the coding mutations per megabase here on the y-axis. And what you can see is, so here are the pediatric um, Cancers, and again, the, the, different can, the different 24 cancer types comprise the tumors I just mentioned in the introduction. So it is uh, different types of leukemias, many different types of um, brain tumors, osteosarcoma, or sarcomas in general, and neuroplastoma. And as you can see, the mutation frequency is overall 14 times lower in the pediatric cancers compared to the adult cancers. So the, mean, the median in the pediatrics is at around um, 0.13 coding mutations per megabase and 1.8 in the adults. However, there are a few hypermutators within the pediatric data, um, but hypermutation exclusively occurred in high-grade gliomas that have also um, a bialelic, oopsie, a B-allelic mismatch repair deficiency underlying like germline mutations in genes like MSH6 or PMS2. So what are then the specific genes that are commonly mutated across pediatric cancer? So this figure now shows um, the significantly mutated genes, actually just the top 20, um, sorted by their frequency in the pan-cancer pan pediatric cohort. Um, as you can see, TP53 is the most commonly mutated gene across pediatric cancer. That's actually also true for adult cancers. And in general, most of these genes are mutually exclusively mutated across cancer types. Okay, TP53 is an exception here. You can see it is mutated across most of these cancer types. But for example, already the second most commonly mutated gene, H3F3A, is mutated only in three of these cancer entities, and this is actually high-grade gliomas with two different subtypes and Wilms tumor. Um, also interesting to note that around 50% of the pediatric tumors harbored at least one of such significantly mutated genes. However, 57% uh, have only a single one. And typically, this, these significantly mutated genes imply driver genes. Um, and this number is definitely lower compared to adult cancer. Um, some of these significantly mutated genes are rare in some of the subtypes, like for example um, in ependymoma here, two different subtypes of ependymoma, um, or in the Ewing sarcoma. Um, however, this of course is only um, implying SNV send indels, and there are certain cancer types which are known to be driven by rather translocations, then leading to a fusion, like it's the case for Ewing, and I come to gene fusions in a moment. But then there are other cancer types which have a lot of these significantly mutated genes, like for example the wind medulloblastomas here have a lot of these driving genes, and especially as you can see here in red, 
a large fraction, virtually all wind uh, medulloblastomas have a mutation in beta-catenin in addition to some other genes. And as I already mentioned, the high-grade gliomas also have a lot of these um, significantly mutated genes. And here I also want to point out again specifically H3F3A, which is affecting a lot of the high-grade gliomas, is actually defining this whole subgroup now since a few years. Um, so the subgroup is the K27M high-grade gliomas because so this was actually the first reported histone hotspot mutation in H3F3A. This um, was discovered by whole genome sequencing of the DIPG high-grade gliomas, and it is um, present in almost 80% of these DIPGs. And this is the histone H3.3 variant, and as you can see, this is the histone tail, and here at the lysine 27 locations is where all of these hotspots are occurring in DIPGs and also in the 35% of the non-brain stem high-grade gliomas. Um, but interestingly, then in another set of high-grade gliomas, which are hemispheric tumors, the hotspot mutation is here at this uh, position 34. So um, this specific gene, H3F3A, but also if you had a chance to read the other top um, 20 significantly mutated genes, you probably realized that in general they converge of, on epigenetic modifiers, specifically chromatin modifiers, are recurrently altered across pediatric cancer, like HCF3A, ATRX, um, SETD2, smart a 4 smart p one just to name a few. So in general, this, this is the largest group comprising roughly 20% of these potential driver genes. Now, back to the general overall number of somatic mutations in pediatric cancer genomes. Um, another interesting observation is that the number of mutation increases with patient age. And we first observed this when we sequenced the first larger cohort of medulloblastoma a few years ago as part of the ICGC project. Um, as shown here, so just different subgroups of medulloblastoma. And when we looked into the somatic single nucleotide variants all, so genome-wide, and the age range is 1 to 17, we saw that there are more mutations the older the patient is at diagnosis. This was also then observed in this pan cancer study. So um, each color represents the median mutation frequency per megabase um, in one of these cancer entities. And again, there was a positive correlation, correlation with age. Also, when looking into all the roughly 800 individual pediatric um, cancer genomes. There are exceptions to this age correlation, like in Burkitt lymphoma. Burkitt lymphoma is known to have somatic hypermutation um, in the immunoglobin genes, so that's also what you observe then in the tumor genome, um, and also other tumors with localized hypermutation, which is called catechis, they did not have that age correlation. So this age correlation um, raises an interesting question, like what causes the somatic mutations in childhood tumors? In adult tumors, it is often mutagen exposure, like exposures to UV light or tobacco smoking. This is definitely not a cause in the pediatric tumors. So what is? So this type of question can be answered with a mutational signature analysis. This is a concept that was introduced by Ludmila Alexandrov and Mike Stratton at the Sanger a few years ago. So the concept, what this means is mutational processes, like for example, UV light or like tobacco smoking cause somatic mutations, which then leave a specific mutational signature behind, um, like certain transitional transversion mutations in a specific base context. And when you now look into the different pediatric cancer types and the 30 back then published um, mutational signatures, what is present it, in all of them and also the majority of mutations come from this is signature A, uh, signature one, which is associated with age. So what this means, and they discovered this also in adult tumors when you take out, uh, deconvolute all the additional mutagen exposure signatures, that the number of cell division is linearly correlated to the number of passenger mutations detected in the tumor. And therefore, this leads to signature one. So most likely, 
in, in many of these pediatric cancer genomes, it is age correlated because it is just passenger mutations that were occurring during cell division up to the stage where the patient then had the tumor and there are very few additional driver genes and not too many additional mut uh, mutational signatures that cause additional mutations. But there are some. It depends on the tumor. And I definitely want to point out an interesting one, which is signature 3, which was associated with double-strand brake repair, HR deficiency, and in general term brackenness. And this is um, interesting because brackenness implies in general sensitivity to PARP inhibitors. So um, this raises then treatment options for some of the undruggable cases of osteosarcoma, glioblastoma, and neuroblastoma, and we're currently following this up in more details. Okay, so until here, this was about somatic SNVs and indels. What about structural variants? Um, as already mentioned, some of the um, um, pediatric tumors do not really harbor significant amount of SNVs and indels in genes, but for example, Ewing sarcoma, the second most common pediatric bone sarcoma, is characterized by most cases having a fusion in the EWSR1 gene, which is actually short for the Ewing sarcoma breakpoint region. So this is the Ewing sarcoma gene. Um, and this is fused to variable members of the ETS family of transcription factors, with 85% being FLY1, as depicted here, and another 10% being ERK. And there are only few additional genomic events. The same is true for the most common pediatric childhood brain tumor, the pilocytic astrocytoma. Um, here, the majority of cases have a BRAF fusion. Here, so here's BRAF, and here the most common gene fusion partner is the Kia 1549. Um, and the cases which don't have that fusion have general BRAF hotspot V600E hotspot mutations, or NF1. In general, the pilocytic astrocytoma is known to be a single pathway disease meaning the MAPK pathway is mutated in pretty much all cases. Um, so to continue with structural variants, chromothripsis also plays a role in pediatric cancer. Chromothripsis is a complex class of structural genomic rearrangements, um, which involves the shattering of an individual chromosomes into 10 to hundreds of fragments. So just for reference, here's a chromosome which is not affected by chromothripsis. Um, it is the tumor copy number. Here you can see one breakpoint, so there's a drop here in copy number and here two amplifications. In contrast, this is a chromosome that's affected by chromothripsis. So you see this sort of oscillating copy number uh, pattern with a few higher amplifications, but in general there are two copy number states. And it is interesting to note that in general in the pediatric tumors, chromothripsis co-occurs with somatic or germline TP53 mutations. Um, and we saw this association when in 2012 when we sequenced the first um, larger number of, of sonic hedgehog medulloblastoma because there is a fraction in sonic hedgehog medulloblastomas that have an underlying Lee-Fraumeni syndrome, so a germline TP53 mutation. And it's specifically those tumors um, that more commonly have chromothripsis. Another um, phenomenon on the structural variant level is termed enhancer hijacking, and this was also first discovered in medulloblastoma in 2014 by Northcott at colleagues. And it, this is a recurrent structural variation um, that repositions the highly active enhancers here in this gene DDX31 to the um, transcription factor GFI1B, which is not expressed in medulloblastoma, but then once there is this translocation, it is expressed, highly expressed. Um, and yeah, so after this was the first discovery later on in medulloblastoma, there was also PRDM6 enhancer hijacking discovered, and by now it has been discovered in additional tumors, including adult cancers. So since this is an educational session, um, you can see if you can test your knowledge. It's not meant to be now interactive. We don't have time for that. But if you like, you can take a photo and look into this later. So what was the most common tumor entity I just mentioned? What's the most common solid entity? What's the leading cause of cancer-related death? Um, what are, is the most commonly mutated gene across pediatric cancer? And again, this is also the most commonly mutated gene in adult cancers. Um, and in general, what additional events, like the chromothripsis I just mentioned, are associated with this. Um, 
And in which way do the pediatric tumors differ in their mutational burden from adult tumors, and what's the potential explanation for this? Um, and what's the largest group of significantly mutated genes? And specifically, that hotspot mutation in the H3F3A is interesting to remember. And yeah, again, also just want to stress that um, fusion genes also play an important role. So now after the somatic mutations, um, coming to germline mutations, so familiar risk and cancer predisposition. So in the um, pan-cancer study, 162 known cancer predisposition genes were investigated for damaging germline mutations. And here on the left side, you can see the tumor types, um, which have the with their proportion of samples being mutated, so highest to lowest. And here on the right side, um, the most commonly affected gene by these germline mutations. So in general, as you can see, the adreno adrenocortical carcinomas have almost half of them affected by a germline mutation. That is actually TP53 that's typically underlying this. So I should mention, again, TP53 germline mutations um, are indicative of the Lee-Fraumeni syndrome which is associated with benign and malignant neoplasms, including sarcomas, osteosarcomas, brain tumors, neuroplastomas, and specifically also the ACCs. Um, for example, as also already mentioned in um, relation to the chromothripsis, this is also underlying here, this um, sonic hedgehog subgroup of medulloblastoma, it's also TB53. Yeah, and when you look again into these genomes, what you probably notice is that um, most of these German mutated genes converge on the DNA repair pathway, um, either like BRCA2 on double strand break repair or like MSH2, MSH6 on mismatch repair. Uh, and roughly speaking, this is sort of one of the newest estimates in the field that around 10% of all children with cancer have an underlying predisposition. And I want to, this was pan-cancer, I want to come back to medulloblastoma again. So from the beginning, medulloblastoma um, had been associated with rare hereditary predisposition syndromes, um, likely from Mini and Gorlin. Gorlin means uh, germline mutations in Petron and Sufu. This is actually also how the first sort of medulloblastoma mutated genes were uh, discovered. But on, until recently, it was not really clear what, a, what is like the consensus predisposition genes and how do they distribute in the different medulloblastoma subgroups. So um, what we did recently is then do a rare variant burden analysis because this is not possible thanks to a lot of healthy um, control genomes that are available thanks to databases like EXA and NOMAD and compared, so did the rare variant burden testing for over 1,000 medulloblastoma samples compared to 50, 000, roughly 50,000 from the EXEC database. And this then um, led to, um, showed a significant enrichment in six genes, um, in, which is significantly mutated uh, in medulloblastoma compared to controls. This is APC. Um, mainly um, attributed to wind um, and the polyposis conditions, which has also been known before. Um, then there's BRCA2, PATCH1, SUFU, TB53, PULP2. And again, the majority of those germline mutations affect the sonic hedgehog subgroup. So now this study showed that sonic hedgehog medulloblastoma has probably 20% of underlying germline predisposition and only 2% in group 3 and 4. And here, if at all, it's uh, PIPE 2 and BRCA2. This has then led to these uh, pro new pro newer proposed guidelines. So to test then, depending on the subgroup, for potential underlying syndrome. Um, for example, for group three and four, as it's still relatively rare if there's a family history of BRCA-associated cancers. So the study I just showed was based on 110 known cancer predisposition genes, but um, what about all the other genes, um, even if they're not already known to be implicated in cancer predisposition? So then we used the same data set, and it, instead of looking into only the 110 gene, we looked into all protein coding genes. And again, doing a rare variant burden testing, um, we discovered significant enrichment in a gene that has so far never been implicated in um, cancer predisposition or medulloblastoma, 
the gene L1, which is also called IKB-CAP. L1 is the elongator complex protein 1. And as you can see here, all the very well-known cancer predisposition genes of Medulopistoma, like PETCH1, SUFU, TP53, are not as significantly enriched like IKB-CAP. I should mention, this is not really shown here on the slide, that this mainly, all of these L1 mutations occur in the sonic hedgehog medulopistomas, and now in 14%. It is much more frequent than any of these genes shown here. So now, meaning that um, 35 percent of the sonic hedgehog medulose can be explained by an underlying cancer predisposition. I also want to briefly mention that um, when there is a German L1 mutation, this is on L1 is on chromosome RM9Q, in the tumor, the second hit is loss of the complete chromosome, of the other allele of chromosome RM9Q. Okay, so now with all these different somatic and germline alterations, what are the potential drug targets in childhood cancer? So the most actionable event can be found in the growth factor signaling pathways, which, sorry, uh, can be roughly divided into MAP case signaling, um, the PIK3 act mTOR signaling, and RTK signaling. Um, regarding MAP case signaling, I have already mentioned that the pilocytic astrocytoma has virtually always um, a MAPK, like a BRAF mutation. Sorry, this is very sensitive here. I should use the mouse. Um, and also, interesting to note that um, loss of CDKN2A locus, so P16, is also one of the most frequent actionable genomic events in pediatric uh, tumors. And in the past uh, couple of years, this what has also been observed or found a frequent fusions of the NTRAC family of kinases. And this is uh, particularly exciting um, since specifically a substantial fraction of the high-grade um, gliomas, the pediatric ones, which are less than three years old, have often one of these NTRAC fusions, either in the NTRAC 1, 2, or 3 gene. In general, NTRAC fusions are also found across different pediatric and adult cancers. And this is one of the few examples of genomic events uh, in pediatric cancer that's a strong indicator for an objective response to a targeted compound with only minor side effects. So, for example, it's larotrectinib. Here are another few quick facts um, about drug targets. So, overall, the number of compounds against specific tumor driving events is still relatively small in pediatric cancer. I mentioned in the introduction, it's just 1% of all tumors, so there's a small market size. The most efficient, efficient interventions are related to the fusion-activated kinases, such as NTREC and ALK, but overall, these events are rare. Um, a new type of targeting based on mutational processes rather than single mutations might um, lead to new avenues of treatment, like for example, I mentioned brachiness and PARP inhibition, or immunotherapy, which I'll come to in a moment. So ultimately, the development of specific compounds for pediatric cancer um, and combining targeted compounds with other treatment options might be the best way forward. Um, yeah, I already mentioned this, that there's not too many new cancer treatments that have specifically been developed for children in the past 20 years, only four. And another big factor is that the childhood cancer is a very, like, the deadliest type. And here, so the additional um, challenge of the blood-brain barrier comes in. Um, so in the past couple of years, um, many, like, quite some clinical sequencing platforms have been established all over the world for pediatric cancer. Um, and they use different sequencing strategies to find sort of try to make um, a molecular profile of the cancer of each individual patient in order to um, find better drugs and specifically also then enable access to different um, basket trials or umbrella trials, so in general clinical trials. Um, as you can see, the sequencing strategies vary quite a bit. Some do panel sequencing of known cancer genes. Um, MAPI acts in France, for example, does whole exome sequencing and RNA. I want to briefly go a bit into more detail uh, into the INFORM registry that we run in Heidelberg um, in Germany. Um, but actually not only for germ patients. We started out as recruiting only germ patients, but um, this is now open for um, a lot of other European countries. 
And what is done in INFORM is a whole exome sequencing, low coverage whole genome sequencing to have a good idea of the copy number variants and detect chromothripsis and related phenomena. And um, RNA sequencing, again, super important for fusion detection. And um, we still also do, just for reference purposes, um, affymetrics, expression arrays, and the Illumina arrays, which helps a lot for sub subtyping. And yeah, and typically this is then after um, just three weeks reported. Um, and there's an initial report ready, and this is then discussed in a multidisciplinary tumor board. And in general, what can be said about all of these different clinical sequencing platforms for children? Um, roughly, there's a, can be in 30 to 60 percent of the pediatric tumors uh, can be a uh, target identified in INFORM, we typically find this to be true for 50% of the patients. So what's with the um, other 50%? What, what are additional treatment options? You're probably all aware that immunotherapy is a revolutionizing cancer treatment and is also um, being introduced into um, the childhood tumors. In general um, speaking, there are two strategies, either immune checkpoint blockade, which you can, which is most efficient if it's a tumor that has a cytotoxic T cell infiltration, because only here the T cell exhaustion can then happen, which the immune checkpoint blockade targets. However, it might, as it looks at the moment, many of the pediatric tumors are probably this um, rather cold tumors, meaning that they're not too many cytotoxic T cells, but rather myeloid um, cells as the infiltrating immune cell type. And then here, adoptive T cell therapies and cancer vaccines are probably the best, better way forward. In general, what is known about um, immunogenicity in childhood cancer? And so, again, this has to do with the number of somatic mutations that the um, sporadic pediatric cancers have a lower immunogenicity compared to adults compared to, and this is interesting, pediatric cancers which have B allelic mesometrial fair defic deficiency, so a germline um, mutation, because then they have very high numbers of somatic um, mutations, somatic coding mutations, and then the more somatic mutations, the higher likelihood for antigen formation. This was um, figured out a few years ago in Uri Tabori's lab based on um, glioblastoma in children that had underlying B allelic mesometrial fair deficiency. But aside from this extreme example, um, in general, immune checkpoint inhibitors in childhood cancers have so far fallen short of the success that is seen in adults. So what we're currently looking into, so this is still unpublished, is in general to study the immune microenvironment, so the immune cell infiltration across pediatric solid tumors. And here we have access to about 1,200 transcript homes, meaning bulk RNA sequencing data from international initiatives like the Childhood Brain Tumor Tissue Consortium, our ICGC data, um, and the NCI target data. So different um, data sets. However, we definitely have sort of a bias towards brain tumors. And I um, just want to briefly show here, if you look into the overall quantification of uh, immune cell infiltration, you sort of get, the, get this uh, picture with regard to sorting. So some of the pediatric tumors, like embryonal tumors or medullopistoma, have very little to pretty much no immune cell infiltration whatsoever. And we know this also based on genomic analysis. This is a very pure tumor. Um, but there are some tumors like pilocytic gastrocytoma or many cases of the neuroblastomas that have um, quite um, significant levels of immune cell infiltration comparable to that of adult cancer types. And very briefly, because this is about mutations, so somatic mutations can shape sort of the immune infiltration set and also been shown before in adult cancers. For example, the hotspot BRAFI 600 e mutation is um, leading in general to more immune cell infiltration. Um, specifically, if you look into the specific cell types like dendritic cells, but for example, less CD4 T cells, and IDH mutations, which are also common in some of the um, pediatric glioblastomas, um, have in general less immune infiltration if they have this mutation. Okay, so again, uh, after this section, this, since this is an educational talk, um, you can test your knowledge if you still 
um, remember what's the most commonly mutated gene in the germline. And hint, it's the same as that somatically the most common mutated gene. And what's the underlying syndrome? What percentage of children with cancer have an underlying cancer predisposition syndrome? And what pathway is most frequently affected by the germline mutations? Um, and then to drug targets, so in which of the pathways can the most actionable druggable events be found in childhood tumors? And which gene fusion um, or gene group of fusion represents an example of the genomic events that are a very promising drug target? Um, yeah, and with that, I want to summarize uh, the presentation. So the large-scale pan cancer analyses that have happened in our groups and others during the past few years um, have demonstrated differences in mutation frequencies, signatures, and classes of driving gene events um, between different pediatric tumor types, but also specifically compared to the adult cancers. Um, the contribution of genetic predisposition is particularly important in this patient population and likely involved in about 10% of the cases. The number of potentially druggable targets uh, which can be acted upon at present is still relatively low, often due to the difficulties in assessing the um, therapeutics in the pediatric population. But new avenues for investigation are emerging and might provide additional opportunities for therapeutic interventions that, such as the role of the immune system, so immunotherapy, and for example, the phenomenon of the BRCA and a signature, which might imply PARP inhibitor sensitivity. And now the challenge is to identify the best way to translate all these findings in a fast and safe manner into the clinical benefit for these uh, young patients. So here's references and recommended reading if you want to go a bit deeper into this topic. Most of the slides I showed and figures are in, can be found here in this paper, The Landscape of Genomic Alterations. Um, this is another great primer, which is also very new and goes through a lot of these initial discoveries of enhancer hijacking and chromothripsis and all of this, again, which were made in medulloblastoma, but were then later found also in other tumors. And I also want to mention that we have an upcoming review article, article in Nature Review Cancer um, about the molecular characteristics and therapeutic vulnerabilities across pediatric solid tumors. It has been accepted. It should be out uh, very soon. Yeah, and with that, I want to thank you for your attention and specifically my amazing colleagues from Heidelberg or people who were once in Heidelberg but are now around the world somewhere. Um, yeah, and the people I show here were definitely extremely instrumental in pretty much every study I just showed. And now I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>